my name is Dr. William Caesar, C-E-A-S-O-R, Renato, R-A-N-A-T-O, Rodriguez, R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-Z, the third. You may proceed. May I please the court, Mr. Ashton. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Dr. Rodriguez. Good morning. Sir, can you please tell us what your occupation is? Uh, first, uh, for the court record, if I may state, uh, I am here as a uh, unpaid consultant, and my objection uh, not responsive to the question. Sustain. Uh, to listen closely to the questions and answer only the questions that I asked of you, sir. Yes, sir. Can you uh, give us your occupation, sir? Uh, yes, I am a forensic anthropologist. Okay. And where are you employed? I employed uh, with the Department of Defense Armed Forces uh, Medical Examiner's Office in Washington, D.C. And are you here as an unpaid consultant? I am. Okay. And how long have you been employed with the U.S. Armed Forces Medical Examiner's Office? Uh, for about 23 years. Okay. And what did you do before that? Before that, I served as the uh, forensic anthropologist and chief of operations for the Onondaga County Medical Examiner's Office. That's O-N-A-N-D-A-G-A, uh, which is located in Syracuse, uh, New York, uh, and was responsible for the forensic anthropology uh, for that office and the uh, surrounding county uh, in Syracuse, New York, and several other counties that we contracted to do the forensic services. Can um, I get you to put the microphone a little closer to you? Sure. The, the, the acoustics are really bad in this room, so. Okay. Um, Sir, can you share with the ladies and gentlemen of the jury your educational background? Uh, yes, I received my uh, BA, MA, and doctorate uh, from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, uh, receiving my doctorate in 1985, and from there went on to uh, my first uh, professional employment, uh, which was with the Caddo Parish, at C-A-D-D-O Parish Coroner's Office in Shreveport, Louisiana, where I uh, served as the uh, forensic anthropologist and chief uh, deputy coroner uh, for that parish. And uh, as part of my job uh, you know, within that particular uh, office, uh, we served about two thirds of the state of Louisiana. Are you a co-founder of the Forensic Anthropology Research Facility at the University of Tennessee? Yes, I am. Is that also known as the body farm? Correct. Okay. How did that get started? How did you start that? Uh, that was actually uh, the idea of Dr. Uh, William Bass, who was my chief mentor and professor uh, at the time at the University of Tennessee. Uh, we uh, were in his office one day discussing about time since death, which was a question that is commonly uh, encountered forensic sciences. What year was this? I'm sorry. This was uh, in the early 80s. Okay, go on. And uh, as we were batting it around in the office, uh, uh, we were discussing, you know, how could we get uh, uh, some better understanding of the human decomposition and how it relates to time since death. And as we were discussing it, uh, Dr. Bass said, well, the only way that uh, we could do uh, this is basically actually study the process of human decomposition. And to do so, we needed to start research and experiments. And so uh, he recruited me uh, into this project to uh, actually uh, build uh, the uh, decompositional facility and start the first research. Okay. And you put up the fences? I put up the fences, helped lay the concrete, uh, brought in the first bodies, and began to conduct the very first experiments. And who wrote the first publications from the uh, I was the uh, senior uh, author research. on the first publications. Okay. And since then, what kind of experience have you had with human decomposition? Well, uh, I've had extensive experience in human decomposition uh, as a forensic anthropologist with my three years in the Cattle Parish Coroner's Office where we deal in a very uh, kind of a subtropical climate. Uh, decomposition was quite uh, evident uh, in many of our cases uh, throughout the state and when we're dealing with decomposed remains because of the heat uh, and the humidity and, and the insect populations. 
And then uh, in uh, upstate New York, uh, I saw uh, similar uh, types of bodies. And then <clears throat> during my uh, 23 years with the uh, government, uh, I've traveled all over the world uh, and looking at uh, various types of bodies and various stages of decays in all environmental conditions that one could possibly think of. And where have you uh, traveled to consult on, on uh, well, let me actually re um, ask you this before that. Um, what is taphonomy? Taphonomy is basically the study of the breakdown of an organism after death, basically what happens to that organism and how it's recycled by nature. Okay, and have you, do you have extensive research in that area? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, and can you uh, give us some examples of some of the, how, well, how many publications have you had in, on the topic? I've uh, had uh, two that I uh, initially came from the body farm. I have a, a chapter in dealing with decomposition and forensic entomology in uh, the second edition of Medical Legal Investigations uh, by uh, uh, Spitz and Fisher. Uh, and uh, I have given numerous papers uh, on a yearly basis uh, uh, to the National Academy of Forensic Sciences and the um, National Association of Medical Examiners uh, on various uh, cases involving uh, decomposition. And how did ent ent forensic entomology begin? Well, basic forensic entomology uh, basically has its roots in Europe, uh, began uh, early in time in America, but it wasn't really that well founded. And it really wasn't until the time of the decompositional research at the uh, decay facility at the University of Tennessee in which uh, the entomology movement and forensic entomology here in the United States really got uh, started. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, that I ended up meeting during uh, that time, uh, Dr. Lee Goff, who's probably considered one of the most eminent uh, forensic entomologists uh, in the uh, country, who's out of Hawaii, uh, was very interested in this research as well as a number of his colleagues. And uh, we began to meet and talk uh, about our research since I had looked at insect uh, activity as it related to decomposing <laughs> bodies. And as a result of, uh, I helped them found uh, their American Board of Forensic Entomology. So would you say you have extensive experience in the area of entomology as well? Yes, as far as insects uh, and, and being involved in the activity uh, in which uh, the decomposition uh, occurs and those insects are attracted in. Have you lectured in the area of entomology, uh, taphonomy, and anthropology? Yes, I have on many occasions. Okay. Have you been admitted in uh, any courts as an expert witness on those topics? Yes, I have. Okay. How many times? Uh, numerous. Can you give us a, just a ballpark? I, I would say in the realm of a hundred or more, conservatively. Okay. At this time, Your Honor, I would move to have uh, Dr. Rodriguez admitted as an expert in taphonomy, entomology, and forensic anthropology. May I vote aye on the entomology issue, Your Honor? You may. You. May I just do it from here? You may. Microphone. Um, how many times have you been qualified as an expert specifically in the area of entomology? I have not been qualified as an expert in the specific field of entomology, but in the use of insects in determination of time since death and decomposition process. Your Honor, I have no objection to his qualification <clears throat> in the area of taphonomy and forensic anthropology and to the extent that insects are involved in taphonomy in that area. But in entomology generally, I do object. Your Honor, he has testified that he has helped establish the American Board of Forensic Entomology. Uh, Your Honor, the re if, if, excuse me. The research that began ent entomology approach came from his. I approach the side, my folks. You may proceed. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez, can you give us? Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your experience in forensic entomology? 
Well, again, uh, uh, early in the decompositional uh, research that was conducted at the uh, body farm, uh, my primary... Can you uh, put the microphone a little uh, closer? Sorry. My primary area of study uh, was looking at the insects and documenting the various insects uh, that inhabited the body, their activity on the body, their reproduction uh, on that body. Uh, and uh, throughout uh, my career, uh, I have worked extensively with forensic entomologists uh, in uh, looking at this similar activity, uh, collection of the insects, uh, and an instruction on to law enforcement on how to utilize uh, and collect these insects uh, in relationship to the decompositional process and utilize them for things such as time since death. How many times have you consulted with law enforcement in the area of forensic entomology? Hundreds. Your Honor, at this time, I would move to have uh, Dr. Rodriguez admitted as an expert in forensic entomology, Your Honor, as good. well as the other areas. As I indicated, I have no objection to him testifying as to entomology as it relates to decomposition, but the broader field of entomology I would object to. The witness will be accepted as an expert witness in the area tendered by the defense and may continue. Yes, sir. Sir, um, what kind of, in what information have you been given, or were you given in this case to review? In this case, I will received the documents and records pertaining to the medical examiner's report and findings of the examination of the deceased. I received the forensic anthropological report and their findings uh, in uh, regarding the deceased. Uh, I also received the entomological report that was generated by Dr. Uh, Neil Haskell. And I also received photographs uh, of the uh, recovery and the scene. Uh, in addition to the photographs that were taken uh, of the remains of the deceased uh, at the medical examiner's office. Now, um, were, did you also examine photographs of the, uh, of the medical examiner that they took at the medical examiner of the skull? Yes, I did. And also at the scene? That's correct. Okay. Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, what any opinions that you may have that have to deal with the collection of the evidence at the scene. Uh, the evidence collection appeared to be uh, very uh, thorough as far as collecting the skeletal remains any time you're dealing uh, in particular with the remains of a child which had many, many more bones uh, than the adult uh, because they're still in the stage of development. Each of their bones are made of individual components. Uh, it is certainly difficult uh, to uh, deal with the recovery uh, of uh, the remains of a subadult. Uh, since there are uh, multiple bones. Uh, when you're in a wooded environment, of course, uh, that area uh, of search becomes much more difficult uh, in, in trying. So in looking at uh, the recovery, uh, it looked uh, to uh, be uh, fairly good. Uh, one of the things I noticed uh, that I did not see in the report or uh, uh, dealing with the investigation is trying to determine the exact uh, location of where that body may have initially uh, been placed. Uh, this is something that uh, I normally do uh, on a regular basis because in dealing with skeletal remains that are outdoors in which they may have been exposed to uh, carnivore scavenging, uh, uh, the bones may be spread from the actual area where that body actually was placed or that body may have decomposed. And it's very important to try to locate that area of decomposition. Why is uh, it important to find the, the exact location? Uh, because uh, when we want to define that area, that is where typically as the body decomposes, we may find uh, much of the evidence related to not only the decomposition of the body, but various types of trace evidence. For example, if a body uh, had uh, been shot, if the bullet's contained within the body, as that body decomposes, that bullet will basically drop down through the body if it's not embedded in the bone and will work its way into the soil. Uh, teeth, uh, typically the anterior teeth that are single-rooted as they uh, fall out uh, as a result 
of the ligaments within the uh, a dental arcade uh, decompose. The front teeth many times will fall out when that uh, skull is moved. And if there's any other trace evidence, such as uh, fibers, clothing, uh, that is typically uh, located and left at that scene. And so we also want to determine not only uh, that evidence or to find that evidence, but it, it gives us a better idea where that body may have been initially placed uh, that can help us in the investigation. What could you have done? What could investigators have done to look for that? How would they find that? I don't understand. In looking for those uh, areas, typically, again, if you have a skeleton that has been dispersed, the area where that body initially... Uh, let, let me object and ask to Vord Iyer, um on the issue of whether the... Can we approach? I need to make a... Judge, I would object. Oh, yeah. Judge, Your Honor. Yes, you may approach. <laughs> What would you look for to try and determine where the initial uh, deposit site was? Uh, what we would look for is areas where there you have evidence of soil staining as a result of the decompositional fluids leaching out into the soil. It will actually change the consistency of the soil. It can change uh, the vegetation by either increasing some of the vegetative growth that feed on some of this, and it will also kill some of the vegetative growth as a result of these fluids smothering. We will also see evidence if there, it is during the time of year when insects are prevalent, carrying insects basically will feed and reproduce in that area. And there remain, such as the puparial cases, some of the insects insects that die during uh, that process or become trapped in the fluids basically will uh, be found in that area of the soil. And so we look for these environmental changes that tell us that a decompositional event had occurred. Okay. And um, did you see any photographs indicating uh, any soil change throughout the scene? I didn't see any. Okay, and you don't, we don't know if they actually looked for that, but you certainly just didn't see any evidence in the photographs. Is that uh, I, I didn't see anything in the report that, that noted uh, that. And would that be something that an anthropologist would note in their report? I, I would hope they would. Okay. Now, do you have any experience in uh, finding remains with duct tape? Yes, I've had numerous cases. Okay, and what are the some of the aspects that you take into consideration when uh, looking at remains that may or may not have had duct tape, uh, either to package them or, or uh, to bound the the uh, victim? Uh, I've looked at uh, numerous uh, cases in which the body has been bound in various uh, ways, everything from wire, cloth, uh, and those cases in which uh, duct tape or other similar types tapes have been employed uh, primarily uh, to bind the hands or to bind the head or the facial area. Uh, in looking at those types of cases, uh, and looking at the binding itself, uh, when we have cases in which the, the body still has soft tissue uh, on them and have begun earlier stages of the decay, we look at the positioning of the tape on the body to try to say exactly where that tape was actually bound to the body. And uh, when we have cases when the body has basically undergone mummification, uh, we get a very good idea of where the, the, the tape is because basically it is attached still to the mummified tissues. In the cases of skeletalized remains that undergo, or basically a body that undergoes decomposition, as the result of decomposition, basically that will affect the adherence of that tape. And so one... Uh, Could I have a discovery issue? I don't believe we do, Judge. Folks, approach the sidebar and cut the comments out. All right, Mr. Ashton, would you make your objection and uh, 
so we can go through it by the numbers. Yes, sir. The objection is that the uh, opinion that is being offered by the witness at this time is not contained in his report of February 21st, 2011, which was provided pursuant to the court order, which specified that any opinion that the witness was going to give uh, must be included in the, in just a moment, I want to try and quote it, uh, had to be included in the um, report as well as the factual basis for that opinion. There is no opinion in this report that references to duct tape. Uh, it is mentioned as a fact of the case, but there is no opinion that references uh, any interpretation of the duct tape or any background information as the witness has just discussed about duct tape in other cases. Mr. Baez. Yes, our position is, and our clear understanding of what the court's order was, is that if it was not submitted in the report or included in the witness's deposition, it would be precluded from trial. Mr. Baez, pull out the court's order and read that portion that you were talking about. And while you're trying to find that, let me ask the doctor some questions. Dr. Rodriguez, uh, what opinion you were about to express dealing with the duct tape? Uh, in uh, reference to this particular case, Your Honor? Yes, sir. Uh, that the positioning of the duct tape uh, as it was found, you can see in uh, the photos there at the scene and the medical examiner's office that the, the duct tape is in two different positions. In a completely skeletalized remains, unless it is in a buried context, one cannot make a absolute uh, finding as to the pos exact positioning of a duct tape as it is lost, uh, its uh, effectiveness, uh, stickiness. Uh, one cannot make a determination as to the restriction of that duct tape and certainly in decomposed remains in which they have skeletalized the soft tissue to which that duct tape was attached and the movement of those remains by animals basically precludes anyone uh, from making any scientific conclusion uh, as to the actual position of that duct tape, whether it was around the areas of the eyes, did it cover the areas of the nose and the mouth, did it just cover the areas of the mouth. Uh, I, in cases that I have had, have only been able to conclude the actual positioning of that duct tape in the case of a burial in which basically it is held in context by the soil or in a mummified body in which the soft tissues basically have dried out and the duct tape uh, is still uh, adhering. Okay. Doctor, when did you uh, formulate that opinion that you've just shared with us? Uh, early on when I saw the pictures. Okay. Specifically, what do you mean by early on? when I received the first uh, pictures from Mr. Baez. Okay, I don't know the date, Doctor, so. Uh, the, the, the photographs were uh, given to me earlier this year, uh, right prior to my report, which was dated uh, uh, February 21st. Okay. Uh, was there any particular reason why you did not include that portion that you just told us about uh, in your report, sir? Uh, I didn't uh, uh, mention it because uh, the, I just, it was a non-issue. Because I, in, in looking at these types of cases, you, uh, there's, there's no scenario where you can make a definitive answer. And so basically I wasn't uh, uh, asked uh, at that time anything about the duct tape. It was just something that I had, had noted in my examination. Okay. You noted it in your examination, but you did not include it in your report. That's correct, sir. Okay. Did you share that opinion with anyone on the defense team? Uh, I did. Who? Uh, Mr. Baez. When? Uh, it was uh, at uh, uh, one of the telephone conversations uh, that we had uh, after my report. 
Was it in January or February of 2011? I believe it was uh, uh, February of 2007. Okay. Were you ever informed uh, by the defense team or Mr. Baez in particular of uh, this court's order requiring all opinions that experts are to give in this case to be uh, placed into their reports? Uh, I was not aware of that, sir. Okay. Were you ever shown the copy of this court's order or informed of this court's order, the one that I've just mentioned about experts being required to put all opinions that they will testify to within a written report or face the possibility of having that opinion uh, not being given in court? No, sir, I was not made aware of that. Okay. So Mr. Baez never informed you of this court's order? That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. May I have a question on those topics? Go ahead. Dr. Rodriguez, do you recall getting uh, some emails from me just before you were to asking you to submit a report? That's correct. And if you can recall, uh, or c can you tell the court if I had informed you that the court issued an order requiring all experts to give their, to issue reports expressing all of their opinions? Yes. Okay. And the communication that you and I had on this, on this topic was via those emails, correct? That's correct. Okay. And when we actually, we met two nights ago, did we not? We did. Okay. And was that time, was that determination made that that is something that we wanted to have you testify about? Or yeah. was it prior to that? It was at that time. Okay. And was that as a result to rebut what uh, Dr. Warren had? Uh, well, let me let me rephrase that. Was that? Do you know if this was in an attempt to rebut uh, what we thought was testimony that was not true? Uh, I was informed uh, at, at that meeting about the superimposition. That was the first I heard about the superimposition done by uh, Dr. Warren. And do you have an opinion as to what that super, if that's, if that, if a forensic anthropologist should do a superimposition? That's correct. Okay. What is that opinion? In doing a superimposition, superimposition is typically used to uh, provide some type of tentative ID, basically identifying a victim by superimposing a skull over a photograph of the victim, utilizing it to show or positioning uh, of a duct tape and skeletalized remains uh, is uh, unheard of as far as I, I am concerned, uh, because there is no way scientifically that you can show where that duct tape was. Basically, you can take that duct tape and you can reposition it anywhere on the body because you have skeletalized remains. It has been moved by animals. Therefore, uh, even I, as a practicing forensic anthropologist, all I could say is there's duct tape and association that was most likely somewhere around the head. I cannot actually tell the position of it. I would be stepping off of scientific foundation if I were to do so. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, the issue of, uh, of all of this, when the court issued its order, I informed all of our experts via email, uh, clearly expressing that we needed reports from them because originally we had not asked them to do so and that all opinions that they uh, were going to testify to should be included in the reports. Furthermore, I informed them that they had a deadline and that if that deadline was not met, that I would uh, suffer dire consequences. Um, you, can, you may recall that um, not only was I sanctioned, uh, we were dead set on making all of the deadlines in which we did. Uh, the, from the time that I asked Dr. Rodriguez to write his report until the time he actually wrote it, it was a matter of days. 
I, I believe the court gave us 20 days or something like that, maybe a little more, I, I'm not exactly certain. Uh, this was a very difficult task for us to do, considering that all of our experts are extremely busy, that have mu multiple caseloads, and uh, of course the, the time constraints that were, were placed upon us. Furthermore, when we were never given this video uh, superimposition during the photo CDs that the state had. Um, I'm not concerned about the superimposition. Well, well that's what I'm, I'm trying to get to, Judge. Well. The, what happened was we did not anticipate this testimony from Dr. Warren. It occurred. When I met with, with my witness, I, I expressed and asked him for opinions on those, and that's what he's rendering. Um, I, I, so the doctor is mistaken or misinformed when he says he told you this in January or February of 2011. That's what you're saying? I'm not saying that. I, 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 but I can tell you this. We've discussed numerous aspects of this case, and there are numerous aspects that are not included in his report, nor will he testify to. So, I, I mean, to sit there and ask him, everything you've told me, make sure you put in your report. I, I, I don't think that's reasonable. What is, what is not reasonable as well, Judge, is that a, a, an important witness on a case like this should have been deposed. They chose not to, and your order says, and I will read as instructed, Opinions that are not expressed in a written report or at depositions taken during the discovery will not be allowed at trial. I asked during a status hearing, what if they choose to, uh, to not take someone's deposition that's gonna limit these people's testimony, it's gonna create due process issues, and uh, this, ex you know, every bit of testimony is important, as is this, and, uh, I don't have uh, to Mr. Ashton's exact quote, but he claimed um, that they were gonna take the depositions and but that this wasn't gonna be some kind of trick that we were gonna play with the reports. My response to that would be, uh, my response to that was something along the lines, that no one's playing games here, just that if they're going, and it's hard for me to, to make representations without the exact recollection, Judge. But my understanding and the purpose I brought this up was they were gonna try and play a pool of fast one by saying, well, if it's not in the report, that's it. I'm not, I, why should I take their deposition and then allow them to testify about more things? Yeah, I, I, do we have to, in a unique situation where the court has ordered so, something, now start taking depositions of our own witnesses. I sat in hundreds of depositions in this case, not because I wanted to, but because it was my responsibility to do so. And I have also taken depositions while this trial is pending. If this is an issue so concerned by the state uh, as to make sure that they know everything that this witness may or may not testify to, they should, they should exercise what they have, what tools are given to them and, and take the depositions and do the work. Well, Mr. Byers, I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked you earlier at the sidebar. What you're basically saying, sir, is that you can pick which court orders you comply with and which court orders you don't comply with. And uh, that's not gonna happen here. I couldn't disagree with you more, Your Honor. Respectfully. Well, Mr. Baez, to, to, to be quite frank, uh, both sides uh, have engaged in what I call game plan. Okay? And this is not a game. And the reason the order was entered in the first place was because both sides were engaged in some form of it at some time. And the reason the order was entered is because I did not want to be at the position I am currently in now. Is that we have experts uh, with no opinions uh, that, I mean, major opinions that are not contained in their reports. And uh, the easy thing is if a report comes about 
or if opinion comes about, you disclose it. It's not hard to do, Mr. Baez. It, it is quite easy to do. Even if it happens at the last minute. So here am I faced with what is the remedy? Uh, it, it's quite ironic uh, that we were scheduled to be here at uh, 8.30 this morning to talk about a possible violation of the rule of sequestration. Uh, so uh, you go back, you review the cases. Uh, and uh, all of the cases seem to say that exclusion of the witness from testifying is a very extreme and harsh rule that is not to be done except uh, in the most aggravated situations. Uh, and, uh, but they list a couple of other things that you can do. Uh, It appears to me that this was quite intentional. This was not some inadvertent slip. This was not some uh, sub-issue of a major issue. Uh, it was not inadvertent. Uh, the question is, is whether or not Ms. Afney should be punished as a result of this. The case law seems to, uh, to indicate the following. Uh, contempt. Uh, an instruction to the jury. Uh, concerning the violation that has occurred and let them use it in judging the credibility or believability. Uh, so what other opinions uh, is this uh, witness gonna give uh, that has not been disclosed uh, in his uh, report? I will also. Well, th this is what I'm going to do. What other witnesses you have available for the day? We have uh, Dr. Spitz as well. Okay. This is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to stop today at 1 o'clock. This witness is going to step down. You can take his deposition uh, this afternoon. Uh, and and he, is, he will testify one day next week, Monday. Uh, I will entertain uh, a possible uh, instruction if the state wants to draft one about this violation and I will decide whether or not I will do it. I will reserve the decision whether or not I should proceed to contempt proceedings at the conclusion of uh, this trial. I would request that the court also look at the um, answer filed by the defense where we had, where I clearly laid out that Dr. Uh, Rodriguez would be called also to rebut any issues raised by the prosecution uh, uh, in trial. Uh, this is, this does fall under that category. And uh, Mr. Baez, this is not my first radio, I want rodeo rather. And, and let me say this, sir. I've tried one or two cases as a lawyer. And uh, there was a case that I tried called the case of the state of Florida versus Judy Buenano. 
at the conclusion of uh, the defense's uh, opening statement and after the first 10 questions that the defense asked in cross-examination, uh, I, I found myself in a boat without a paddle because they raised the issue that uh, you could not tell that they were raising up until the time uh, they asked certain questions. Uh, and uh, at that noon recess, I asked my investigator to find certain things out. Uh, by four o'clock that afternoon, uh, my investigator had located about four or five additional expert witnesses. I talked to them that night. The next morning in court, uh, I filed a supplemental discovery of those witnesses and I set them all up for depositions the following evening so the defense would have an opportunity to take those witnesses' deaths, I mean depositions, uh, to determine what they would testify to. Uh, so the defendant would not be surprised. All my order simply tried to do was to give both sides an opportunity to know what each expert would testify to so they could prepare so we would not have no gotcha moments where someone would be caught unprepared. So what we would do is we will take a, a 10 minute recess uh, and uh, Dr. Rodriguez be prepared to give a deposition this afternoon at one o'clock uh, and uh, then we can ferret out uh, all of this, but let me say this. Lightning does not strike twice in the same place. Even though the case law says you can't be punished by exclusion the first time, if there are other opinions that you know that he's going to give, they need to be laid out. Because I, I am not making any promises or warranties about what I would do if it happens a second time with this witness. We would like to pay, place the state on notice that we're going to take our own de experts' depositions at the conclusion of today. If they wish to be present, they can be, be present. And we well, you don't have copy. to take your own experts' deposition. I, I'm making him available for the state to take his deposition. It would be totally unfair to Ms. Anthony to have his testimony excluded on this uh, critical issue. Uh, but we will deal with the after effects afterwards, and that's the remedy that I have chosen uh, to give. We'll be in recess until five minutes to the hour.